Hello everyone, and welcome to War in Middle-Earth, a series where I take you through all of the major wars and conflicts throughout the history of Middle-Earth, from the First Age to the Fourth Age. In this episode, we look at the Dagger Aglareb and the nigh 400 year long Siege of Angband, as well as Morgoth's attempts to break it. The Siege of Angband would allow for one of the most peaceful and prosperous periods of history in Middle-Earth, but it would also lead to complacency, which would eventually prove dire for the foes of Morgoth in the future. The year is 60 of the First Age, almost 100 years since the first Noldor under Feanor landed upon the shores of Beleriand. The time since those first battles has been a time of peace and healing, and the Noldor have spread out far and wide across Beleriand. Fingolfin has become High King of the Noldor, residing in the lands of Hiflum, with his son, Fingon, as a vassal in the lands of Dol Omen. His other son, Turgon, resides in Nevrast and Vinyamar by the sea, as Gondolin has not been built yet. Further south lies Nargafrond, the newly created realm of King Finrod Felagund, son of Finarfin, who did not make the journey to Middle-earth. In the north, in the highlands of Dephonian, ruled Finrod's younger brothers and vassals, Angrod and Aegnor, although their people were few in number. To the west, the Pass of Sirion and the Fortress of Minas Tirith, not the same Minas Tirith from the Third Age, but a different one, was held by Orodreth, the son of Angrod. In the wide lands of Eastern Beleriand ruled the sons of Feanor, Maedros upon his hilltop fortress of Himring, whilst Maglor defended the lowlands known as Maglor's Gap. A little to the west, Kelegorm and Curafin defended the Pass of Aglon, while to the east, Karenfir took up residence in the lands of Fargelion. Far to the south were the lands of the Twins, Amrod and Amras, which they ruled from atop the hill of Amon Erep. During these years, the Noldor had been building up their realms and forging alliances with the Sindar Elves, who had already lived in Beleriand, with the exception of King Fingol of Doriath, who intentionally distanced himself from the Noldor, especially the sons of Feanor. But from Morgoth's perspective, he saw this as the Noldor being complacent in their wide new lands. It had been 60 years since his last defeats, and his forces had recovered enough for a renewed assault upon the lands of Beleriand. Thus, he began to formulate a plan. Although he had somewhat recovered, Morgoth knew he lacked the strength to overwhelm the Noldor all at once, like he had attempted to do to the Sindar in the first battle of Beleriand. This time, he would focus on one target the lightly defended lands of Dothonion held by Angrod and Aegnor. Before his main force departed from Angband, he would release a flood of smaller orc bands who were to penetrate the lands of Beleriand either by speed or stealth, in an attempt to create confusion and destruction behind the Noldor's lines. Once the distraction was achieved, his main force would cross the fields of Ard Galen and overrun Dothonion, punching a hole in the Noldor's defences and creating a forward outpost for himself in future conflicts. The strength upon either side is largely unknown, but we can, of course, make estimates. Morgoth's main army likely numbered above 60,000, but was probably smaller than these armies that had fought against the Noldor and Sindar many years before. For the Elves, it's likely Angrod and Agnor had no more than 5,000, as their people were small in number. Fingolfin's army likely numbered above 20,000, and Maedros's army would probably be a bit smaller than that, but still likely above 15,000. I'm not going to count the other forces of the Noldor and Morgoth as they did not participate in the main battle. As usual, I want to point out that these numbers are not from Tolkien himself, and are just my guesses, so they're, of course, not canon. At Morgoth's signal, the Iron Mountain spewed fire, and his orc bands set forth, and as planned, many of them made it deep into eastern and western Beleriand. However, the distraction proved less effective than he hoped. The forces of Nargafrond, the Phalas, and some of Feanor's sons were drawn into battle, but the main forces of Fingolfin and Maedros were not. Meanwhile, Morgoth's main army set forth across the fields of Ard Galen and attacked Dorthonion, but the few yet valiant people of Angrod and Agnor held the hills against them. At this moment, the armies of Fingolfin and Maedros set forth from Hiflum and Himring. Morgoth's army, realising their flanks were completely exposed, pulled back from the hills, but it was too late as they were crushed between the armies of Fingolfin and Maedros in what would be known as the Dagor Aglareb, the Glorious Battle. The Noldor's losses were few, yet the entirety of Morgoth's army was shattered, and the few survivors were slaughtered even before the gates of Angband itself. Morgoth's plan had been a complete disaster, and now his foes were at his very gates. Morgoth's armies were once again shattered, but his fortress of Angband was too strong for the Noldor to assault head-on. King Fingolfin was aware of this, but he also knew that Morgoth would attack Beleriand again and again unless something was done. Thus, the Siege of Angband started late in the year of 60 of the First Age. The Noldor built camps and defences upon the plains of Ard Galland, even patrolling beneath the gates of Angband itself. As long as the siege was maintained, then Morgoth would be trapped inside Angband. Or at least, that's what the siege was supposed to do. 
Unfortunately, the geography of Angban meant that a full siege was actually impossible. The impassable Iron Mountains flanked Angband on either side, meaning that Morgoth's forces could still leave Angband from the frozen north. And the pits and tunnels of Angband were so deep and numerous that Morgoth could continue to grow his strength, even as his enemies wandered around his very doorstep. In actuality, the Siege of Angband was more of a containment, but the containment was not enough to stop Morgoth from being a major threat. In the year 155 of the First Age, Morgoth attempts to outwit his besiegers. Using his access to the frozen wastes of the north, he sends a smaller army around the siege and attacks Hiflum from the north. However, this plan failed too, as Morgoth's army was met by an army of elves under Fingon and destroyed near the Firth of Drangist. This battle, relatively small and unimportant, was never given a proper name and was not considered to be one of the great battles of the First Age. In 260 of the First Age, Morgoth tries again, unleashing the latest of his twisted experiments, Glaurong, a dragon, upon the besiegers. This has initial success, and it temporarily drives the elves away from Angband. But at this point, Glaurong was still young and not fully armoured. Elves on horseback, once again led by Fingon, use their mobility and speed to pepper Glaurong with arrows while staying out of his range, and eventually the dragon flees back into Angband. This would commence the start of the Long Peace, a period of time where Morgoth would not attempt to break the siege of Angband. During this time, the Elves of Beleriand grow even stronger, not just due to peace, but be also because of the arrival of the Adain, the forefathers of the Numenorians who fought against Morgoth. These men arrive in three groups, the House of Beor, the House of Halef, and the House of Marak. These men would mostly settle in Estelad to begin with, but would eventually spread out across Beleriand. The House of Beor would settle in Ladros and Dorthonian, the House of Halef would settle in the Forest of Brethil, and the House of Marak, later known as the House of Hador, would settle in Dor Loman. With the arrival of the Adain, Fingolfin realised that perhaps now they had the strength to assault Angband, but this wasn't met with enthusiasm by most of his allies and people. After all, they had built strong, prosperous realms across Beleriand. An assault on Angband, even if it were successful, would result in huge casualties, and it would perhaps be better if Morgoth was simply left to rot inside Angband. However, unbeknownst to them, Morgoth was biding his time, slowly but surely recovering his strength. And when his time came, it would be with forces so overwhelming that the Siege of Angband would shatter and be swept away in a sudden flame. But that's a story for the next episode. I know this episode had a lot more world building than actual battle, but I will assure you that that's about to change. As for the Dagger Aglareb, it receives barely more than a paragraph in Tolkien's writings, as the battle was so one-sided that there wasn't really much to talk about. For Morgoth, it was his most crushing defeat inflicted on him by the Noldor, but it was a defeat that he would absolutely learn from. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. I have had a lot of comments from people who want me to do an in-depth on the battles like Pelennor Fields, and I'd just like to say that this series will get there eventually. I have planned it out, and The War of the Ring alone will probably get 8 or 9 episodes dedicated to it. Until then, leave feedback, ask questions, be lovely to your fellow humans, and remember, if you're marching across a flat, open field, it's a good idea to protect your flanks.